All right. Are we recording? Yes, we are. Good morning. All right. Welcome. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome to another uh, Christian Virtual Fellowship. If you're uh, enjoying these videos and you want to join us live, feel free to check us out on allegiancetotheking.com. Get connected. And we'd love to have you and have you get involved in the discussion and uh, get connected and make some new friends. So anyhow, today I'm going to continue what we're kind of kicking off as the Marks of the Christian series, which last time you guys would recall, I, I, I talked about pride and how we can identify pride um, in, in less common ways. And then now today I want to start a series that's actually going to be two parts because six chapters of Daniel is far too much to try and go through in one session. And um, so I've titled this Commitment, Courage, and Camaraderie, part one. Um, and uh, another way of looking at it would be accessing God's blessing and protection during trying times, which is going to be us studying the patterns and the lessons found in the first three chapters of Daniel. So I wanted to get started by just introducing basically everything there there is to learn already distilled out um i shouldn't say everything but everything that i'm going to be going through today um i wanted to distill it out for you guys to to have in the forefront of your mind as we go through some of these passages so that it isn't a challenge to to see the pattern emerge from the stories we're going to go through um, so anyhow, basically that pattern, I think, can be found all throughout the first six chapters of Daniel. And it's one that shows what commitment to God looks like, what courage looks like, and how having close friends is important and kind of pivotal in certain circumstances to us being able to exercise commitment and courage and how we serve God. So what we're going to learn as we read through these chapters and, and verses that we're supposed to be doing ourselves is that we're, gonna, we're supposed to be resolving to commit to God's ways no matter what happens in our lives. We're supposed to be being watchful for situations where we can intervene in a uh, smart or shrewd way on behalf of God's will. So that's one of the more interesting parts that I hope you guys see as well as we're going through this. We're supposed to be humbly seeking God's revelation, his guidance and his help with our close companions, not just by ourselves. And we're supposed to be acting courageously in what God has prepared us to do. And then as we act in these courageous circumstances or manners, we're supposed to magnify God, but minimize ourselves, not, not giving regard to whatever factor is involved in us, but primarily and pretty much wholly expressing what God has done in whatever he's called us to do. So if we apply those things, which we'll see happening as we look through this, these are the results we can expect. And again, I hope that bringing this up first will help you guys be able to instantly recognize this pattern as we, as we read through these passages. So, if we're, if we're acting in a way where we're resolved to commit to God's way, we should notice that we are being chosen and set apart to do important things. So that should be something that, that happens in our lives. And then we should also experience the ability to influence people who are in positions of power over us or in positions of power compared to us and we should be able to influence them and affect how they decision, how they make decisions. We should also be witnessing 
events of wonder where there's either provision or some sort of miraculous power or some type of deliverance going on. These will be um, the types of things we should see if we're, if we're behaving in these ways. And then the outcome of, of these things would be the massive glorification of God in ways that we could not have projected or predicted or made happen in our own power or in our own ways. And it also result in vindication for us and, and God's other servants. And then the final outcome of this generally is that it's going to bring exaltation to us as God's servants to be in positions of more influence if we continue down this path, because, you know, as we know, there's plenty of scriptures, which I hope that in the discussion after this, we can, we can see what kind of scriptures are coming up in your guys' minds. Um, Cause I'm not going to refer a whole ton of outside scripture or any at all, really other than Daniel here, but you know, we know, we know verses like how to those who are, are given much, much is expected. Right. And um, you know, the parable of the talents and things like this, where, you know, if we're, if we're, if we uh, manage little, well, we're given more to manage. And so if, if we can act courageously for God and magnify God and humble ourselves, he's going to exalt us and give us more power more ability to influence people of power to bring about more glorification to God and more proclaiming of who God is and what his purposes are. So let's start in Daniel chapter one. I am going to uh, title this as playing the hand you're dealt. So we're going to get into a lot of things and I hope you guys notice some mirrors in our own society or in your own life that you can apply. But let's start in Daniel chapter one. So I'm just going to kind of have notes of an overview of the story that happens here because there's no way we can just read three whole chapters. Um, but I will, I've got the, the verses here on the side and I'm just going to give the overview and then I'll read some choice verses that kind of push the story along and emphasize important things. So in the first two, two verses of Daniel chapter one, it begins with the king of Babylon capturing Jerusalem and, you know, so basically, Jerusalem is uh, no longer under control of the people who inhabit it generally, right? So think of this, put yourself in the shoes of these people here. You know, in, in our situation, that would be kind of like, uh, you know, you live in, you live in Washington, D.C., and an invading army comes and takes over the city, and all of a sudden you are, uh, you know, <laughs> you're a subject of that capturing force of that invading country. So you're under the power of them. And, and obviously most people probably wouldn't view that as a great thing usually. Um, and probably most people would think this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> um, so the king, Nebuchadnezzar, then after they've, they've captured the city, they order the best of the young men to be taught in the ways of the Chaldeans, so their, their wisdom and literature, and to be educated for three years and then to serve the king. So after that, it's kind of like, let's take all the best people and, and make them our servants and to do our work. So not only has your, your way of life been interrupted, your whole world been taken over by an invading force, but now you're gonna be pulled away to serve them and their political order rather than doing what you think is probably the better thing in your own, you know, country's custom and all that sort of thing. So now in verses five and seven, we find that Daniel and his friends are chosen and they're all given new names. So here, let me read this, uh, this portion here. Um, I'll start in verse uh, three. King ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom had no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning and knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. He ordered them to teach, he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. 
Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and, Daniel, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. So this is kind of like the, uh, the complete uh, upheaval, in my mind, of, of normal for these, these four fellows. That uh, they're going to be taken out of whatever it is they've been doing. They're going to be initiated into a whole new uh, culture and way of, of being, and they're even given new names. So in my mind, the lesson from this to us is that sometimes God is going to have plans for us, is going to have a purpose for us that we couldn't predict, that we couldn't foresee, and that we would appear to have not, not adequate preparation for. But I'll, I'll point this out is that the, the pre-qualifications that were set to choose people were that they were, they had no defect, were good looking, showing intelligence, had, had understanding and discerning knowledge and had ability to serve in a king's court. So there's, there's a degree to which if you are, if you are behaving and seeking and acting and living your life in a way where you are suited for honorable service, then that is, that is a form of preparation that you can engage in to be called and chosen for higher purposes. So something to keep in mind is that God isn't going to be choosing people that just sit on the couch and watch TV and uh, haven't, haven't been pursuing learning and education and self-improvement in ways that prepare for greater services, if that makes sense. So there's a lesson here that obviously Daniel and his friends were men who had been young men who had been preparing themselves for, for greatness in a certain way that, that had them chosen. And then this idea of them being given new names, well, obviously it practically makes sense, you know, generally with different language and different culture, names are different. And if you have a foreign name, it's kind of awkward and, um, you know, like, we tend to, uh, you know, like for instance, a lot of immigrants from, from Asian countries, you know, China and things like that, they will take on a Western name oftentimes if they immigrate because it just makes it easier to live in society when you have a name that's easy for people to pronounce. Um, so there's that, but of course, this can be symbolic as well that, that God is going to put you in situations where you have to start from scratch in a way you have a new identity in a sense and that you have to embrace the fact that everything that you knew and everything that was, was familiar and comfortable to you is going away and you need to engage and embrace this new, this new normal or something. And um, so that's kind of the, the transition I'm seeing here in this. So here's where we start to see this pattern emerge. In verse eight, it says, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. So going back to that pattern, the resolve to commit to God's ways and seeking the opportunity to influence circumstances to harmonize with God's will. So Daniel, he, he makes up his mind, but then he also sought permission from the commanding of the officials that he might not defile himself, right? So he's not just saying, ah, I'm not going to do it, and I'm just going to be disobedient, and I'm going I'm to cause a stink. He actually seeks a way to peacefully enable himself to just do the right thing without it causing any problem. So this is that discernment and that seeking of opportunity that I see. And... Um, so in verses 9 through 16, um, Daniel makes a shrewd proposal to secure this ability for him and his friends to remain obedient without their causing any sort of problem. And um, so what he does, um, we'll, we'll just read verses 9 and, and enough of them. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces look more haggard than the youths who are their own age, who are your own age? 
then he would, you would make me forfeit my head to the king. All right. So then Daniel verse 12 says, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let, you, let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice foods and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them and this matter was tested for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold the choice food and the wine they were, drink, they were to drink, kept giving them vegetables. So this is one of those situations where it's like, well, Daniel basically reasons, well, God has told us, you know, I don't know the exact details of the rules here. I don't know what kind of food it was that the king was, was uh, you know, appointing that was undesirable or unfit for them according to God's ways. But whatever it was, they knew those details. And Daniel's like, well, we can't eat this food. We can't drink this wine. We need to, we just want vegetables and water. So how can we get this to happen? He makes a proposal. This is, this is like a faith thing, right? Like he believes that God's, uh, you know, idea of how they should eat is going to be a benefit to them. And so there's no problem. There shouldn't be any issue of them looking worse or seeming less healthy. They should be the same or better. So he basically draws on that faith and belief that God's ways are the right way and says, look, just, just give us 10 days. And this is where he, he makes a shrewd and discerning proposal to win favor and to make God's will harmonize with this situation. So verse 17, um, this is important. Um, as for these youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So this is important to recognize is that it doesn't say that the Chaldeans or the commander of King's Guard or whatever it is, um, gave them the knowledge and intelligence. It says God gave it to them. So this to me is a reflection in a way back to verses five through seven, where these guys are being transitioned into a whole new world to a whole different purpose that they maybe didn't expect. And God is preparing them. This is God doing this. This is not happenstance in a way that they, they should be complaining or just dealing with it or whatever. This is God doing something, right? And so this is, this is a preparation verse right here. This is showing that God is working in this situation. It is him giving them the knowledge. And it is, it is him that has given Daniel even the ability to understand visions and dreams. This is for a purpose, right? So in uh, 18 through 21, finishes things off. I'll just read it here. It says, then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for, for, for presenting them, the command of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. So playing the hand you're dealt. These guys, they didn't fight it. They weren't like, oh my gosh, this foreign, evil, god, godless, idolatrous nation has taken over our kingdom. You know, this is terrible. We need to rebel and, and you know, turn away and, and head up some sort of rebellion or whatever. Um, there's, there's this interesting idea that, you know, we need to, to get over thoughts that we have of, of what the world should look like and what, what should happen in our circumstances politically and all that sort of stuff. We need to be okay. There's, there's this weird kind of uh, balance, I would say, where, you know, it's not that being a Christian is, is taking the path of least resistance and just going with the flow, but it's that we need to worry about what we can control and not worry about what we can't control. And in this situation, Daniel and his friends did just that. They couldn't control who was going to be in, in, in power after Jerusalem's taken. And they couldn't control who's going to be chosen and not, you know, based on the initial assessment of who's going to go into this service, right? They were chosen. And so they took the hand that was dealt and they 
recognized that God had purpose for them and, and was working in this situation and they went with it and then they sought to control what they could control, which is themselves and who they could influence to stay faithful to God, to stay obedient to his ways and to accept what he was doing and, you know, accept that this was his preparation for them, right? Because how easy could it have been to say, I don't need to learn this knowledge of the Chaldeans. This is stupid. I don't, this is not important. This is not godly information, whatever it might be. You could make all sorts of excuses, but that would be disobedience. That would be them rejecting what God had prepared them for. And so there needs to be an openness to things happening in your life that don't seem to be good, that don't seem to be in perfect harmony with some magical Christian, amazing kind of things are going perfectly situation, but accepting that preparation is preparation for things that you can't see that God can, right? And so they just humbled themselves and accepted what God was doing and, and did their best. And the result here is that they were exalted and they were found better and they were brought into the King's service and, and placed in, in positions of, you know, influence. So moving on to chapter two, um, I've called this recognizing your call. Let's get to chapter two over here. All right. Um, so verses one through three. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call on the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they, could, so they came in and stood before the king. And the king said, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. So <clears throat> the king had dreams and they were obviously very troubling and problematic for him because he wanted to understand them pretty, he's pretty anxious to understand them. Calls in everybody, all the wise men he can think of and uh, wants them to tell him what it means. But the interesting thing is that, you know, in this whole uh, situation here, the king, he, he's, you know, you can tell he's clever. He's not just some stupid guy in charge here. He has, he has a brain in his head because he wants to know the real truth. He doesn't want to just have somebody make up a story. He wants to know the real meaning of these dreams because he realizes that these dreams are very important and meaningful. So he doesn't just demand that they give an, an interpretation. They demand that they tell him what happened in the dream and an interpretation because to him, that would signify that they actually know what's going on if they could reveal the dream itself without being told what happened. But of course, this is not possible for man to do in their own power. So <laughs> the Chaldeans are obviously nervous. They say, um, well, let, me, let me tell you how intense this is. Uh, <clears throat> he says to them, um, the king, king replied, the command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your house will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. This, they answered a second time and said, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will inter declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command for me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king commands demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant, very furious, and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. So problematic situation because the Chaldeans can't do this miraculous thing because the king really, really wants to know the real deal and he doesn't want to get tricked by them using some sort of smart, sneaky, uh, you know, whatever. He gets, he gets upset and says, all right, I'm tired of all you wise men. You're useless to me. So let's just kill them all. This would result in Daniel and his friends being killed too because they were part of the wise men. 
So verses 14 through 16, same thing. Daniel seeks to have an influence over the people he can shrewdly and makes a request that can help harmonize the situation with God's will and make it, you know, okay for them to keep living. <laughs> um, so verses 14 through 16, Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard who had gone forth to slay the men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. So this is a moment where Daniel understands, he says, what's going on here? Why is this happening? As soon as Daniel hears what the story is, he's like, oh, I see. He gets it. He sees that God has prepared him for this, that he has a call, that he has the ability to understand dreams and visions. So God has prepared him to be the person who can kind of stand in this situation and make a change. But this is not something that God has already given him the interpretation and given him understanding of the dream and revelation of it. He just sees that he's been prepared. And so in faith, he makes the request that he would get time with the king to make the declaration of the interpretation, even though he hasn't got it yet. Verse 17, now that he knows this, he brings the news to his friends that they would seek God so that rescue could be made for him and, and all the wise men of Babylon, his friends, that, they, that he could be the man who gives the dream and the interpretation. So Daniel went to his house and informed his friends so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, um, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So after Daniel was given the answer, he praises God. So he says, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we request of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. It's totally amazing. And now this is something that I want to be able to pull out of this study of Daniel for everybody, because here, those of us in the U.S., now I know the Pereiras and Edgardo, you guys are not dealing with the same kind of culture and, and kind of situation that we're dealing with. But for those of us here in the United States, it's very tempting to, to, to have uh, a lot of thinking that things are very bad here and things are going in a wrong direction. And there's a lot of problems and things could be on the verge of collapse and all sorts of problems could be happening. But the reality here is that, is that <clears throat> God is the one who changes times and epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and, and, and knowledge to men of understanding. We don't need to worry about what's going to happen politically in situations because God is the determiner of these things. God is the influencer of these things. And God works in his people to make what's supposed to happen, happen in these situations. Because obviously, you know, a righteous king that honors God would have been more ideal for Jerusalem. But instead, we have an idolatrous king, Nebuchadnezzar, who doesn't give regard to God ruling in Jerusalem. So obviously, we could just say, oh, this is evil. This is evil. But God has bigger purposes going on. And bad people being in charge doesn't stop God from doing what God's going to do. So continuing on. Um, Daniel then gets the opportunity, of course, to speak to the king. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke with him, to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, 
Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, okay, so Daniel, this is what I'm writing right here, verses 24 through 30. Daniel speaks to the king, exalting the power and purpose of his God, not glorifying himself. So let's read this and you guys can see. Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place for the, in the latter days. Notice how he doesn't say he's made known it to me so I can tell it to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. He just says, he just excludes himself from the whole picture and says, he has made it known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. <clears throat> As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries had ma has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. So I hope you guys can see this. Daniel basically excluded himself, didn't glorify himself in any way in this whole situation. He basically was an, an invisible um, channel for which God was speaking to the king. This is how we need to act when we're doing the work of God, that we are just a channel from which God is speaking his purpose to who that purpose is directed towards. So verses 31 through 49, Daniel explains the whole dream. I recommend you guys go and read it, but basically, you know, he, he tells him the whole dream, interprets its meaning, and we get to verse, um, let's see here. I'll just read the last verse of the interpretation. It says, inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future so that so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Verses 46 on, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. Nebuchadnezzar starts worshiping Daniel. <laughs> because of this. The king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mystery since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, and he made him a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And here we go. Another shrewd intervention by Daniel and Daniel made request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon, while Daniel was at the king's court. So the result, yet again, when people are committed to God's ways, when they seek situations to make God's will happen, when they act courageously and humbly to act for God's will to be done, honor, exaltation, and glory to God are the result, right? So this results with Nebuchadnezzar basically worshiping Daniel, but then speaking honor towards God, promoting Daniel, and Daniel takes that opportunity where he is like the most powerful man in the room because even the king is bowing down to him. And he says, you know, could you make my other friends, um, you know, over, over administration in, in the province of Babylon here too? Cause you know, these are great guys as well. And, and, you know, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, putting, putting people committed to God in more position of power to have more influence for the things of God. Right. So the last chapter we're going to go through is going to be related to this chapter three. Uh, I've labeled this no compromise. So this, as we know, is, is, the, is the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So in the first seven verses, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, sets up a huge golden image. What is it like? 90, 100 feet tall golden image. 
and he sends and he, and he makes an idolatrous decree that people are to worship that image when they hear, hear a certain musical sound. So I can, I can read some of this. It's kind of lengthy, but they set up this golden image. Um, let's see. Verse two, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the province were assembled for the dedication of the image the king had set up. They stood up before the image and set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, O peoples, O nations, and men of every language that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. So <laughs> um, there's this specific musical array that people are supposed to hear that I'm sure was a unique sound to indicate it's time to bow down and worship this image. Otherwise, you're going to be killed in the fiery furnace. Now, um, this would be the equivalent of like, okay, so now here we are, you know, um, some years in, and Jerusalem's been taken over, right? So imagine if we were to use the U.S. equivalent again, this would be like, um, you know, Washington, D.C. has been taken over and is ruled by a foreign government now. And they've converted all of the government to their own form. So this would be kind of the equivalent of like this giant idol has been set up. And now, you know, the, the Congress and the Senate and the, and the, uh, the Supreme Court and, and all the mayors of every city and, <laughs> and every, every uh, you know, like the FDA and the, and the EPA and every different government department has come to now be at this dedication for this, this holy thing that everybody needs to worship. And um, of course, if uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are obeying God, they're not going to obey this command, right? So verses 8 through 13 were, were, were shown that, of course, these men don't obey this command because it would be idolatrous. And um, they're accused of ignoring the command. And, uh, you know, here's what happens. So Verse 8, for this reason at, the, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. All right, so he's all mad, right? So what happens following is uh, the king, he asks Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if it's true, you know, because he likes these guys, they, he, he appointed them at Daniel's recommendation. He trusts them as good, wise men. So, you know, it sounds like he didn't really take the word um, of these uh, Chaldeans at a hundred percent face value. He said, well, this is unacceptable, but let's find out and see. So he says to them, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Now, if you are ready at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? So, here we go, guys. This is the purpose, right? Their obedience has led them to a purpose. Look at the pride of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's experienced Daniel and his, his God explain this, this mystery and dream and interpretation in a way that no one can, bows down and, and worships Daniel. It's, it's, to me, it would seem strange if, if Daniel didn't make known that, uh, you know, the same God he serves, these men serve when he requested that they be <laughs> appointed. But maybe he's forgotten. Who knows? But he clearly doesn't regard the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be this powerful, to save them 
to save them from him in this power that he has. So his pride is showing here and he wants to, he wants to make people submit to him. So this is amazing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they respond and they say, they don't even say, oh, king, live forever. They don't give him any honor in that way. They say, oh, oh Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. <laughs> if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Period. <laughs> Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered towards them. That part I find interesting. You know, to me, that I think is kind of like, you know, and, and I don't know the, the underlying, you know, uh, idiom here, if there is anything. But to me, this just kind of indicates that Nebuchadnezzar, he had respect for these guys. You know, he appointed them at Daniel's recommendation, who is like the top dog. And, but now they've said this and his pride has taken over and he's lost respect for them. And now he just has fury for them. He just has hatred towards them. So he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded, I'm going to move this bar out of the way. It keeps blocking me. Anyway, whatever. Um, he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes, and they were cast in the midst of the fire of burning burning of blazing fire, the furnace of blazing fire. To me, this is kind of like they were like straight jacketed five times over <laughs> and tossed into the fire. So for this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the fire and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So valiant men who were in Nebuchadnezzar's, arm, Nebuchadnezzar's army. So these are probably guys that Nebuchadnezzar did respect and value. And he acted so intensely in his rage that he had them killed in attempts to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because the fire was so hot. Crazy stuff. But 23 through 27, but these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the fire of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up nebuchadnezzar was astounded and stood up in haste was it not three men were cast bound into the midst of the fire they replied certainly o king look i see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods then nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the furnace of blazing fire he responded shadrach meshach and abednego come out you servants of the most high god and come here then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around. All these people of power gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor, the, was, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them, completely untouched. Normally, you'll get the smell of fire on you just from walking past the campfire, but they didn't even have the smell on them after being inside of the seven times fire. All right, so the result of all this, the result of their commitment and resolve, obviously these guys, you know, they were depending on each other. They were encouraging each other. They knew when this decree went out that they were gonna probably get in trouble, that this is something that they could not hide, that they were not bowing down. It's almost like today with masks. <laughs> you can't hide the fact if you don't wanna wear one. <laughs> Everybody's gonna be looking at you funny. Um, so they knew that they were gonna get found out, but they resolved to obey. And then when the time came, they acted courageously and they, they spoke what they needed to speak. And as a result, God exalted them, God delivered them miraculously. And here's the end result of it. 
verses 28 through 30, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as to not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. All right. I'm going to point out because I, I, there is going to be part two. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has, has been humbled in a sense twice now he's bowed down and worshiped daniel because daniel's god was able to reveal the the dream itself and the interpretation he's humbled now because he thought he was able to kill shadrach meshach and abednego for them violating his his decree but no god is more powerful than him and he gives regard to god in that and he even makes a decree now that if you speak bad about this god you're done for <laughs> And then he, 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 he prospers Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego further because of this whole happenstance. But spoiler alert, when we get into part two, Nebuchadnezzar is not a humble man yet. But this is the conclusion of what we're going to go through now. So summarizing this stuff, life has many unknown twists and turns that we cannot predict or be fully prepared for. But God wants us to go with the flow of what we can't control and intervene and influence obediently where we can control, which is ourselves and the people we can influence to make things more harmonious with how God wants us to act. Because this is the way things are, we shouldn't be worrying or be anxious about the, the details of the challenges we face, but we should be concerning ourselves about these fundamentals being in place, that we are committed that we are going to be circumspect, looking for opportunities to intercede and make God's ways happen, and that we're committed to acting courageously in situations where we're confronted with danger or risk, so that we are putting ourselves in a position for God to act fully in our behalf so we can be victorious. So we have to be committed to God in everything we do. We have to be watching for opportunities to influence circumstances to harmonize them with God's will for us and for whatever. We have to be seeking God's guidance and we ideally should be doing with others who we can closely depend on, who know the intimate situation, who we can share everything with, who we can express our emotions to and deal with our, our inner doubts or whatever it might be so that we can move forward strongly after we've resolved to do what's right. And we have to be okay with being put in situations that we are not comfortable with or we don't feel prepared for. All of us have gifts and strengths, right? Our gifts and strengths can go away, you know? Um, I'm reminded of the, one of my favorite verses, I think it's uh, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, where it says, uh, the, the wise man shouldn't boast in his wisdom, the strong man shouldn't boast in his strength, the rich man shouldn't boast in his riches or his wealth, but, but he who boasts should boast that he knows the Lord, that he exercises justice and kindness on the earth for these things that he delights. We should not rely on our strengths. We should recognize that our strengths can go away anytime. If you're smart, you could get in an accident and get brain damage. If you're strong, something could happen to you to, uh, you know, debilitate your body. If you're wealthy, money can, can something bad can happen that can, can destroy your bank account fast. It flies away. These things we can't depend on, but we can depend on God to use us as willing vessels if we commit whatever we do have to him and regard him as the source of those strengths. And if we are willing to go into situations where we maybe don't feel strong and allow him to create new strength in us, and maybe we don't need to consider what we're already strong at as the most important thing that we're set to do. We need to act courageously and humbly, always magnifying God working in us not us being the source of whatever cool, mighty, interesting, miraculous thing going on. So to finish things off, um, I hope that, uh, that you guys have seen the pattern 
going back to that second slide, that, that these are the fundamentals of, of how we are supposed to act and how God acts on our behalf to build us up, to prepare us, to put us in positions of power, to exercise his purpose in our lives. And I would encourage you, because part two will come sometime next month, verse or chapter four through six, we'll see some of the same patterns. And if you guys want to read those chapters in advance, apply this understanding or this pattern to it so you can witness it yourself as you're reading. Because these are records of great men who, like Joseph or Elisha, for example, these guys were examples to Jesus so that he could live his purpose. So it, it you know, we should be learning from these guys too, because if they were good enough examples that God determined for Jesus to learn from, we can learn from them too. And we can recognize this pattern of how God works in the lives of his servants. So last thing, the first six chapters of Daniel clearly reveal the pattern of how God prepares people, what he expects of them, how he raises up and exalts his servants and how he humbles and deposes leaders who live in pride. So hopefully we can all learn from this, continually apply it to our lives be okay with whatever might happen in the world around us that we can't control and instead concern ourselves with what we can control, which is ourselves, our mindsets, our commitment to God, our desire to live righteous lives, and our ability to influence whatever um, circle of people of influence we have connected to us to inject God's will into the situation so that we can bring about God's purposes. And that was all I had to share for now. So I will stop sharing my screen. And I am happy to hear what people are thinking. And I know there's been some chat. Um, let me see what people have been saying. All right. Josiah says, I kind of like this king. Though obviously pagan, he doesn't seem to continue in hardness. He does get prideful, but submits authority when the true God shows up. Indeed. But as I said, there's still some pride left in him. We'll find out about that later. And Dean, yes, I was hoping that this would become apparent that there are some parallels going on, right? That this is applicable to everybody, that it's not healthy to get too obsessed with a certain political outcome because it doesn't matter. God is in charge and he can make things work out for his servants, no matter what the environment looks like. So we got three raised hands here. I think the first one I saw was Dean. So I'll just go, I didn't know who was next. So I'll just go Dean, uh, Rosalind, Josiah. So go ahead, Dean. Okay. Uh, number one, excellent teaching. Um, I am hoping that you will email these. I will. <laughs> on PDF to me. I'll PDF them and send them on the on the the chat group. Okay. I can email them to you if you want to. <laughs> Please, yes. <laughs> um, I still have to learn about technical issues. <laughs> like if I was in the Navy today, I would not know how to deal with it. It is so technical. <laughs> okay. Um, in our country today. I, I'm using one, one situation that's common to all of us in America, and that's the gay liberation crap that's going on in America. And virtually every corporation, every politician, everybody that plays that game has endorsed it or has gone along with it because, because, they have, because they're coward. They're cowards. In, in that aspect, they're going along with it. I can remember when I was a security officer at one key bank in in Toledo, and the request came down from the top that everybody was to endorse the gay parade and support them, and I refused to do that. You know, if if I if I get into a a job today, that's pretty much going to be common. You're going to have to go along with that, or you're going to have to say, listen, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm not going to go along with that. And that's the way I would have to stand. It's going to come to the place in our nation, I really believe, and it's not far from it, where if you don't reject Jesus Christ, 
and Christianity, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to lose everything. Uh, I really believe that's going to happen in our nation. And so we're going to have to, because you know, it's, it's gone down and the morals in our nation have just gone down terribly. Um, so we're going to have to take a stand. I'm just being realistic from what I see and what's been going on for decades. Um, and it's gotten to that place, you know, at the Democratic Convention, they gave the uh, um, uh, allegiance to, to the flag with, and they omitted the words under God. They did that. See, so, I mean, that's what's happening in our nation. Um, and so we're going to have to take a stand. And, you know, I'm too old to worry about it anymore. I've got to take a stand uh, for God in Christ. Uh, and, you know, obviously I need strength and encouragement from my brothers and sisters like we all do. Um, and we're going to have to take a stand wherever we're at. Um, I just see that happening in our nation. And I'm sure it's going to happen in other countries as well. We're just going to have to take a stand. We're going to say, I will not bow down to your golden image. I'm not going to do it. That's it. Now, if God delivers, first of all, God's going to deliver me eventually anyway. <laughs> yep. Yep. And this life is really short. You know, I'll be 76 next month. And that's nothing compared to eternity. That's nothing at all. Indeed. Yeah. And, you know, I think, uh, I think probably one of the best, you're right, Dean. Um, the, the challenge is that this isn't new, right? Um, it's just, it's just always amplified, especially during election cycles. And because it's like the, the goodish guys versus the completely evil guys or whatever, depending on your perspective. Right. And, um, so the reality is, is that this is not for us to worry about at all ever. And it's always, there's always going to be opposition to God via people in power. And so there never, there never is a complaint. There never is a worry. There never is a frustration expressed by Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in these accounts of the government not being the way it should be at all, right? So that to me is a lesson in and of itself that if we can let go of that being an important thing for us to attach ourselves to, then it's not a boundary or a blockade that can interrupt us from actually causing glorification of God within the higher echelons of the political system, right? Because what happens in this, the highest of the high is praising and proclaiming God and decreeing things to, to honor God. But it's not because people that are the servants of God are complaining that God isn't being regarded, right? <laughs> it's because these circumstances boil down into a confrontation between the political power and God. And the servants don't get in the way and, and make a, kick up a stink or anything like that, right? So you, it's an interesting picture that is quite contrasted from the norm of, of Christianity in, in the United States, especially. Um, but it is true that there's tons of people who you can see who are, are perfectly fine to bow down and worship the golden image, whatever it is in this era, right? There's, there's you know, like, like you're saying, corporations, you know, Gillette, whoever it is, they'll, they'll get, the main issue of me, it isn't just, you know, you know, homosexuality it's the whole social justice movement which is in opposition to god's form of justice and 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 the true understanding of how justice works and people are bowing down to it left right and center all over the place and of course we don't need to bow down to it but it's not complaining about the fact that it's been set up and people are called to bow down about it that we're supposed to do we're just supposed to ignore it. And when confrontation comes, seek God and rely on God and be humble. And he will glorify himself through us and vindicate us through it. Right. So yeah. Um, Josiah or sorry, Rosalind, go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, um, I thought that was really good. Um, really like your teaching, and um, it was such a yeah, it's such a good example of how God's holy fire protects His men from you know an earthly fire. Um, that they are actually completely protected. Um, I find, well, that's kind of a fascination I've had recently is the holy fire of God. Um, and um, that's such a good story, sort of showing, you know, why why one would need that um, uh, yeah it says in Hebrews and in Deuteronomy that um, our God is a consuming fire and and also how in Hebrews 1 7 of the angels he says he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire um so many other verses you know jesus also you know, baptizes in the holy spirit and fire and it's like um god's holy fire which is pure and um protects from uh, yeah anything in this world um, yeah so really cool um, really cool story actually yeah yeah it's, it's very inspiring and um, yeah I'm, I'm, I, I originally had intended to do all six chapters but after looking over it for like two minutes I'm like no it's not possible <laughs> in one session um because yeah it, it's there's still much coolness to come still but yeah you make you're inspiring me to do a study on on uh it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living god <laughs> go, go ahead josiah <laughs> so it's definitely something i needed and uh the reason why is because I care a whole lot about people and uh, um, just seeing people around me in this country um, is just, it breaks my heart. <laughs> I'm like, how in the world am I going to reach people in general? And uh, even if I reach just one at a time, you know, it doesn't seem like I can make much of a dent, but you know, just by being faithful, like that whole country saw the power of God <laughs> and, um, and it's just, I I needed to see the bigger picture of what, you know, God can do anything he wants with just a faithful person. And um, that very last part about being content, um, it made me look up what Paul said in uh, Philippians 4. Not that I'm speaking in being in need, for I've learned in whatsoever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I've learned the secret of pl facing plenty and hunger abundance and need i can do all things through him who strengthens me and and then it made me think that like he talked about caesar's household being converted <laughs> like people in caesar's household just by just by him being faithful and um, following god with everything and uh so yeah it was definitely encouraging and um i'm looking forward to see what part two is like because i know it, it's the same king that eats grass like an ox right it, yes. I'm just, I'm really amazed that God deals with this specific king so much. And maybe it's because there are faithful people around him and God wanted to uh, bless him for that. Because I, I know like uh, Pharaoh was blessed for Joseph's um, obedience as well. So maybe that's another thing to keep in mind is your faithfulness could impact some ungodly people to actually get dealt with when normally maybe they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, awesome, awesome teaching. Cool. Edgardo. 
the the pitching is so inspiring, Jackson. Uh, it really helps us to be strong, be firm, and uh, be bold. Especially when you are engaged with people who are not believers, just like the king that uh, that was mentioned in the story, King Nebuchadnezzar. And I also see in the story the confirmation of God's power, God's intervention, how he intervened to people who are righteous. Indeed, in Proverbs 12, 21, we are uh, informed that there will be no harm that will befall uh, to the righteous people. Huh? No harm befalls the righteous. And in also in, in Psalms chapter 34, we can read there that whenever the righteous cry out, the Lord hears them and delivers them from their troubles. <laughs> uh, we can see all those verses in, in the story. And yeah. also the port, the port man in, in the blazing fire, in the, in, in the furnace. Uh, it was an angel, right? Uh, it's also in Psalms 34, verse 7. Uh, we have angel. Yeah, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who reveal him and he delivers them. <laughs> it's a, the Lord indeed is faithful and he is true with this word. Yes. And this story that we have just uh, studied, that we have just read, uh, can give... Uh, it can give a righteous man to continue on and be faithful on, in doing what the Lord has uh, given them as their task, uh, most especially in reaching out to people who are unbelievers, in reaching out to those who are hard-headed, hard-hearted people. Yeah, you 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 don't scare. You you are not uh, afraid. Is there is no reason for you to be afraid about because you know, for a fact, that the Father God who is in heaven is with you, and He will be giving you success in doing His will, just like this uh, story that you have just shared jackson very inspiring very encouraging and it really helped me to have a strong faith it adds f strength to my faith thank you jackson thank you <laughs> great and <laughs> thank you Ricardo, i gotta say your response to it is kind of exactly what i wanted to come out of it is that um because as I mentioned in the beginning and you guys saw throughout, I, you know, there's so many verses that you could refer to all throughout scripture that are pointing out the type of stuff that was happening throughout those stories. And that's kind of what I wanted to happen is that I just wanted to read Daniel and hopefully reading through that story brought up verses in your guys's minds where it's like i've read the verse that says this and here it is happening right here because <laughs> um because that's that's kind of the the power of a story like this or like joseph or, or whatever right is that we see the reflection of how god makes these verses and promises come true in real life in these stories and then we can put that on our own on our own situations and, and run with it right so it's very cool yes
Great. Well, um, George, go ahead, and then maybe we'll stop the recording after that. Okay, Jackson. Uh, that's a great outline that you have there, and I was hoping maybe you get it from you. Um, <clears throat> excellent. But um, I, I noticed some parallel verses that that came up at the end of Daniel 2, mm -hmm. um, where Nebuchadnezzar uh, promotes Daniel. Um, I take that back to, back to Genesis 41, <clears throat> where uh, Joseph is promoted to second in command by Pharaoh. <clears throat> um, then then uh, Joseph uh, ends up inviting his brothers, and his brothers are, um, <clears throat> you know, treated, I guess, you know, pretty good. <clears throat> by Pharaoh's government. And the same thing in the end of Daniel 2. <clears throat> Daniel asked for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, to be promoted. So I, I, <clears throat> I see, I've seen that verse in Genesis, but I think there's more verses throughout the Bible. And <clears throat> if anybody um, can, can reflect on that, I would be a good thing, you know, like, um, I, I know there's more <clears throat> verses in the Bible that, that deal with that, you know, trust God and, and he'll make you come through it and, and, you know, you'll be promoted in, in life, you know, or promoted in front of people and that it'll like you. But that's all I got to say. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought up Genesis 41 because I, I brought it up on my screen right when you said it and, Immediately, verse 16 popped out at my face. I'll read the, I'll read the context of it, but it, it teaches the exact same thing as part of what Daniel teaches, right? So um, let's see. Verse 14 in Genesis 41, it says, Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. They hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I've heard it said about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Verse 16, Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. <laughs> God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. <laughs> uh, so Pharaoh spoke to Joseph in my dream, behold. Right, so same exact pattern that there has to be a complete divestment of us being the uh you know the um important factor of making things happen for god's purposes to be wrought it's that we're just a channel for god to work through because we are in harmony with him and it's almost like you just have to ignore yourself and then you can't be ignored <laughs> uh, so that's very cool um all right, well, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, and then we can have some more discussion and prayers after this. But, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you enjoyed that um, and you want to join us again, uh, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have your thoughts and uh, interaction. So feel free to reach out to us on Facebook or comment on the YouTube video or check us out, legionsofking.com, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>